panel members, it is 11 o'clock. Uh, we already have a couple of people on board, attendees, which I do not want to waste their time. So I think without further ado, I will start then this off by formally welcome um, all the attendees um, to this webinar on the value creating role of family businesses. Um, as we will see, family businesses have a huge role to play here in the UAE, um, in the GCC environment, matter of fact, globally. Um, so uh, on behalf of the Dean of the College of Business and Economics, Professor Mohammed Mahdi, it's my, then my pleasure to welcome you to onto this webinar. Um, the webinar is forms part of a series where we address relevant topics for the business and society um, as a whole um, here in the UAE. Um, we are fortunate to have with us today three people that are experts in their field. Um, we have Ms. Uh, uh, um, Aisha Al-Mansouri, who is the Executive Director of the Emirates uh, Family Office Association. Um, she can talk about what she does there. Uh, she is an alumni of the American University of Sharjah, an electrical engineer, and has a lot of experience um, in the field of family businesses, also having spent time at uh, two of the big four organizations, um, consulting organizations. We then have Dr. Rodrigo Basco, who is a professor in entrepreneurship, family business, et cetera, at the American University of Sharjah. He is part of a fourth generation uh, family business. Those of you who were not logged in yet, I made the joke and say, yeah, skip the three generation curse of family businesses. Um, and he is generally viewed as an, a global expert in the field of family businesses. And I was fortunate enough to be directed to him by my one colleague, Dr. Ryan, who is then the third uh, member of our panel today um, in the early stages. Uh, Dr. Ryan is an assistant professor in an entrepreneurship family business here at the CBA, as I said just now. Um, also has a lot of experience in starting businesses, uh, very much an entrepreneur at heart. Um, he has a, PA, a, a DBA and he has a, a two master's degrees. Um, somebody that I think is uh, uh, very well qualified, not only to be um, on this panel, uh, but also to be within business schools and to convey his experience to the youthful audience um, within the university and today as well. So, uh, Ms. Aisha, Dr. Uh, Rodrigo and Dr. Ryan, thank you for your willingness to come and share your insights, your wisdom, your experience uh, with the panel. Um, I have, uh, with the audience rather, I have 16 questions that I have identified in advance. And um, I will be asking the panel members their views on these, but you as the attendees, please do not hesitate to uh, send me via the chat function. You can send me questions, which I will then pose to the panel members. We will be joined at 10.30 by Mashaika um, al Nuez, who is the Corporate Vice President for um, Owner Relationship Management at Rutana. Uh, Mashaika, uh, Ms., uh, um, uh, Aisha, thank you so much for also opening that door for us. Uh, it has uh, enabled us to put together four people that I think that are eminently qualified and experienced to share pools of wisdom with us in general. Yeah, so, uh, thank you. Um, without further ado, I would like to set the scene briefly by sharing the information that I, some of it I shared on the flyer for uh, today. Um, asking the question, why are family businesses special and what challenges do they need to deal with? Now, the challenges I'm going to leave to the panel and I'm going to touch upon some of the business or the issues that make family businesses special. Uh, 2019 Price Waterhouse Coopers uh, study, um, they said that family businesses are exposed to a, a set of new market dynamics which require them to rethink their business models and their skill set. Uh, Mashaika, thank you so much. I think you're on early. Uh, welcome. It is good to see you. Um, ladies and gents, just if I can introduce Mashaika on the way. So I spoke about her. Um, she is then early. She would have only joined us, and we are grateful that you're here. 
Thank you for your um, willingness to, to share. You guys are lucky. I managed to finish from a meeting a bit earlier today. Wonderful. Earlier expected. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much and welcome on board. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you for having me. And thank you for privilege. the introduction, Aisha. Good to see you. You too, Habibti Sheikh. Always a pleasure. Rodrigo and Railhan. Is that how we pronounce your name? Yes. Okay. Yes, Rodrigo. Thank you very much. Thank you for You're all doctors. Me. Are you doctors? I yes. can see. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, but you can call yeah, Rodrigo is Yes. <laughs> Why Sheikha, I think that's a sign for me and you to go do some PhDs and put a DR next to it. I have the business. I tackled the challenges of uh, the region. Yeah. <laughs> You're all from, from, are you all like working in uh, UAE? Uh, yes. University? In yeah, the line, right? I am in Alain University. Uh, uh -huh. is from American Research Sharjah, okay. and Ms. Aisha works with the uh, ah, okay. you know <laughs> Of course. Yeah, I'm with the CBE, but we are in, in, in Abu Dhabi. Right. You are now officially welcomed, Ms. Aisha. Thank you. So, uh, Thank you so much. We look forward to your views. I was just talking about the things that make family businesses special. And according to PwC, I said that... Um, there are issues, factors in the environment that have to be addressed, such as technology, the whole issue of digitalization, the trust in institutions, the role of technology, and how millennials are changing how companies do business. They also believe that family businesses, and I quote, are more likely than other companies to, to treat each day's activity as an investment in the long term, prioritizing broad stakeholder interest over satisfying the quarter, uh, the quarterly earnings journal uh, um, uh, a cycle rather. Um, according to them, family offices play a crucial role in shaping the world of wealth, wealth management and investment, overseeing trillions of dollars across approximately 10,000 family offices globally. This is huge. These entities are embracing innovation and actively pursuing disruptive ideas to drive growth in this ever-changing global economy that we find ourselves in. Closer to a home here in the Middle East, that they say the growth of family businesses is high on the priority list as they significantly impact the region's economy. In 2019, family businesses contributed 60% to the region's GDP and 80% to the workforce, while an estimated $1 trillion will pass from one generation to the other by um, 2030. In the UAE itself, um, according to the Ministry of Economy in 2023, up to 90% of private companies in the UAE were family businesses of all shapes and sizes, contributing about 70% of its GDP, which is staggering and employing much of the region's workforce. However, and there's the caveat, only about 10 to 15% of family businesses in the UAE make it to the third generation. And I think it's safe to say this is a global phenomenon and not limited to the um, UAE. The total turnover of the interviewed companies of the 29th sur survey in the Middle East top $10 billion. Uh, the half work in multiple sectors in the countries while a quarter do the same globally. Um, in the 2023 survey, PricewaterhouseCoopers found that 26% of family businesses in the region succeeded in maintaining a double-digit growth. Um, other research that I came across, they found that by 2026, the UAE's family office market could oversee more than $1 trillion. This is now according to Henley and Partners. This creates a, a certain view of the importance of family businesses um, and it begs questions about the challenges that they face, why the three generation challenge um, and, and what does the world look like going forward? Um, how are we going to deal with this and how should we be dealing with this? And the first question that I came up with is that, um, Ms. Aisha, there I kind of picked you as my first victim. You represent the Emirates Family Office Association. What is the role of family offices in general? How do you see it? And the EFOA specifically within the world of family businesses. And if the rest of you can also contribute as to how you see the role, uh, Mashaka, you 
live and work in a family business, how do you experience the role of the family yeah. office? So two things, if I could put... Two things, two things before you go ahead. Number please. one, I have a, a question. Yes. Why is this topic becoming a hot topic? Is there a reason coming from like like as scholars and 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 from universities is uh, are you tasked by the government to work on this topic <laughs> or no, I'm just no, curious to no, know no. <laughs> because Dr. Ryan and I we spoke I've about been, SMEs. I've been I've been I've been scouted I've been questioned about this topic a lot lately so yeah. I was just wondering if is this something that you guys uh, as as professors as scholars have been working actively to to do a research and especially in this part of the world uh, that's the first question right. let's answer that one first dr ryan and i uh, was part of a webinar on end of june on smes and okay. i said you know this is such an interesting topic that we should look more of this and in my background i you know i was before i came here i was in singapore uh, and singapore and in singapore family businesses are huge uh, as is the case over here and then he made the point, he said, we're working on family businesses. Um, and if you look at the research, uh, I quoted one, but there's so much other work done by the other consulting businesses on family businesses. Then he suggested, listen, this is something that we need to touch upon. Um, it has a lot of legs. It is something that's interesting. It is something that is huge in the, in the UAE. I mentioned the figure there, um, you know, 60, 70% of the GDP is contributed by family businesses. So that's in the UAE. Why. That's in the UAE. Yes. That's in the UAE. This is according to the UAE Ministry of Economy. In 2023, 90% of private companies were family businesses, contributing 70% of its GDP. So it tells you that family businesses play a unique role. But that is also a question that I woke up this morning. But then I thought, okay, maybe this addresses it. But we have three people here one on the family office side and two people studying it from an academic business perspective. So I'm going to hand over now to uh, Dr. Ryan to go further with that. Uh, Another thing, sorry, question. before we continue again, um, uh, Rotano Hotels is not a family. People tend to have a wrong perception of Rotano Hotels. Rotano Hotels started as, uh, started, it was founded by my father in 1992. Uh, and we're now a private joint stock company where a lot of people that entrusted us and gave us their properties to 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 operate because it's 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 a hotel management chain mm -hmm. um, um are part of uh, the main structure which is the management uh, company so uh yes i am uh i'm you know, trying to take on uh, my father's legacy and make, find ways to sustain and continue to grow but mm -hmm. it's not a family business we do mm -hmm. own uh, shares and um, maybe uh, I represent our uh, our our uh, share of the family, but people tend to get confused with with it being a family. Uh... Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that input. Um, I, I would start off uh, start off by answering this. How do we define a family business? I would let the exactly. uh, senior professor. Uh, Dr. Basco, you know, define, first of all, bring clarity to this particular, you know, notion. How do we define academically and in practice a family business? I think that uh, the definition could be very restricted or very broad, but mainly is when family members, they own, govern and manage a family, a, a, a business, yes, or a economic activities. Also. That's that could be the the, the easy the easier way to, to to understand family business is when a group of family members they are working together or they have ownership in a particular business and they can influence the decision making of this company. Uh, Ms. Aisha, I think there is a decree on you know family business and I'm sure uh, the family business office is following Which, that to define family business in UA context or how do you define in UA context? I mean, I have a different perspective. So basically, um, family offices act as trusted advisors, all right? They guide families into making informed decisions about their investments, estate planning, philanthropy. They are a very important tool for families operating businesses and a lot of the wealth that comes behind it, right? 
From an EFOA perspective, our mission is to encourage and develop a higher degree of sophistication among family offices and businesses, not only regionally, but also globally, by offering them tools and insights on their community building and learning opportunities, as well as policy and advocacy and financial structures. So we come from that perspective of why family businesses are important. And on a point that Sheikha has mentioned earlier, I mean, why is it becoming a very important topic? I think because Sheikha, family offices are starting to play a very important role within the whole ecosystem. So they're no longer like just standalone, right? They are part of the ecosystem and they do have a lot of impact on many different aspects that we do, whether it's on a like country level, global level, like on different schemes. Yeah, it's, I, I think that I, I would like to highlight two, two things, Aisha. I think you, you perfectly, in terms of we have to separate what is a family business and what is a family office. They are two different entities. A family business is, is a business where a family are working together. They have the same uh, the intention to, to continue across generation. Uh, one element in the corporate governance, it could be the family office. Yes, that the family office, as you said, is going to manage, we can say, the, the, the wealth of the family. But also it could be a completely different entity that is a family office that the family decided to put their wealth in a family office in order to make it grow and bigger. And that's excellent. And, and then the second element, Sheikha, uh, uh, answering your question, why family business now are in the, in the everyone is talking and, and there, is, there is two things. One is an intention from the government, I can perceive. Uh, you have few initiative at the government level uh, related with family business. The first is a new law in family business. So finally, there is an intention for the government to help family business to sustain, to keep, and, and to be part of the, the, the identity of this country. There is a lot of in, initiative like Thabat is, is uh, with next generation of family members. But I would like to, to go and, and give me one minute more. It's an historical perspective. Go back to the 70s, when this country just started. There was a vision of the country. I would like to tell you who implemented the ruler's vision in this country, family business. Family business were a very important economic actor in placing or implementing the ruler vision and to have the wealth that today we have. So all of these entrepreneurs in the 70s, yes, that they invested time, effort in building a row, hospital, and all what we can see today is because of a family business. But he, here is the point, is what next? We are shifting from a resource-based economy to a knowledge-based economy or entrepreneurial-based economy that it means a huge jump from what we know and what we want to achieve with this. Um, we are UAE 30, uh, 2031, no? this the, the project. So finally, is how family business could adapt and survive in the new strategy that the government is developing to convert this country in a knowledge-based economy. And here is the question is, what do we need to do and the, and the government is afraid is how the next generation are going to find opportunity in this new environment that will be that has a different technological perspective, a different social uh, shape, and of course economic economic aspect. No? I don't know if I, I give my ideas. Look, I I have a view on this, um, Doctor uh, Rodrigo. I think um, two things. Uh, number one, from from my experience and from my exposure and interactions with different family offices, different families, and particularly in Abu Dhabi, I think number one, the first generation is not, it's it's they're not willing to let go and give the reins to the second generation. This is number one, and this requires awareness, I think, and giving. Being able to let go means entrusting the second generation and making sure that you know they have all the values aligned 
and instilled within the next generation to be able to carry on and um, uh, implement going forward. So I mean, it has to be every family differs from one another, but on, I think they need to be more aware of uh, the benefits of succession planning and the benefits of having the right governance in place. I think governance is something that needs more attention, especially in the UAE. I feel because I have a lot of family friend, friends that have been uh, integrated into the family business in Saudi and particularly in Khobar and Dammam. And they have a very strong governance. They are not in the business because they're, they're related. They're in the business because it's merit-based. And they they kind of test them and they groom them and they 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 do a lot of things. Like I have a friend, I'm sure you know of uh, the family called Al Zamil. She said, Sheikha, uh, and Al Zamil is I think three or four generations, and you have the Kimijis from Oman. They have to go through a very tough assessment and a plan to be able to earn the positions they're in today. And I think this way, I this should be kind of implemented here. Um, um, I, I'm an example. I have joined the business in 15 years ago. Before that, I started my career in KPMG. I didn't want to leave, but I'm sure my dad saw something in me and he asked me to join. I didn't want to leave because, you know, as a new fresh graduate, who had a lot of aspirations in mind, a lot of expectations. Maybe I wanted those expectations to be met before being ready or feeling feeling confident enough to move on to my second, uh, you know, to the, the second stage of my career. But it's all about experience and it's all about the person as well. And I, I as mentioned also values, is having a, 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 an alignment in the values or sharing the same values is very important. Any of you have contributions to make to that? Because I would like us, uh, Dr. Ryan, please. Okay, I just, just to touch upon Ms. Sheikha's point, we have seen a change in the family you know, dynamics all over the world, not just the region or our families from elders of parent-centric families to children-centric families. The shift in the family dynamics has it, and to what extent influence family business is I think a good uh, question to discuss, ponder, and maybe you know further research. As scholars, we need to carry out that. And sorry, I think also, uh, Johannes, you mentioned something very interesting towards the beginning of, of uh, towards your, uh, during your introduction. And you said millennials, our generation, I don't know if Aisha would agree with me on this, but the 80s differ completely from the current generation. We yeah, are completely different. different. Yeah, we're more, um, uh, uh, we're more patient. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, uh, perseverance is something that I think, you know, we, we all share. Uh, and this, my, I come from the 80s generation. But now they're so fast paced, they, they, they can't wait. They're impatient, yeah. Sheikha. Yeah, they can't, <laughs> exactly. They're, they can't but... wait. And this is very, it's very important that we get this kind of um, integrated from the beginning. But, uh, uh, Sheikha, I would like us to stand still on that point because I actually had a question on that. You spoke my hope ball game over here, but I think the dynamic is wonderful. So thank you for, for, for bringing that on board. And that is the issue then of succession planning. Will you make the point is that the first generation don't want to let go? Why don't they want to let go? Is it because they don't trust their children? Your father seems to be the exception because he looked at you and he said, here is somebody with talent, with the competencies, with the abilities, bring her on board. But um, in general, is succession such a huge challenge? And I do get the impression that it is. Uh, but then what are the challenges? Why don't they want to let go? How should this process be dealt with? You mentioned governance. You mentioned training. You mentioned the value system. 
Um, and, and, and Aisha, from your perspective on the uh, family office side, when you look into these businesses, what do you see? And then I would like the two academics also to say from your experience, your research, um, what is this issue about succession planning? Why is it such a huge issue? Because I can recall back from my experience in Singapore, where I was fortunate enough ex to be exposed mm -hmm. to a couple of family businesses, mm -hmm. it remains a huge challenge. So over to you. All right. So You're smiling. <laughs> okay, all of you are smiling. It seems that this is a topic which um, really has, you know, a lot around it. Aisha, will you start? Sure. Look, I I really like adhere to what Sheikha says. It is a very important topic about, you know, generation one letting go to generation two, the trust factor, the the look, I'll tell you one thing about a family office. And it's it's separate to a family business, right? We need to really differentiate that family businesses are different than family offices, right? Because to the point that was done that a family business is a business run by a family, right? You've got the yeah. family involved. A family office could be an office that the family businesses are into it, but there is a complete structure. There's a legal setup, framework, governance, and the list goes on. So there's a very important key role that families need to play into, which is succession planning. And ensuring that the next generation is prepared to take the lead. That is very important. People think it's very easy. You know, we'll bring them into the business a year or two. You know, we'll train them. We'll prep them. They'll understand. But it's actually a very long and important process. And ensuring that the correct succession planning is there in place. The governance is there in place. By succession planning, we mean like you can include setting up like a bulletproof governance and legal framework so that the business is protected for the future and for it to continue for generations and generations to come. So I think family leaders should kind of take control of that process, but ensuring that they are making the right decisions for the future of their family business and passing on like the required knowledge and information to their next generation is very important. And I think Yani Sheikha can is is into it, involved maybe on a daily basis into it from that perspective. But we also see it from the association perspective where we get a lot of questions about what's next, what would happen. Do you think that family business is going to continue once, you know, like generation one will entrust it to generation two? Will they really take the responsibility? I mean, and seeing like the difference of the age gap, it is going to be an issue because as Sheikha rightly said, the next generation is impatient. They cannot wait. They don't want to like pause and think. They just want to like get on the drill and actually move, which is not a bad thing. But there are there were bases and foundations for why things are done that way, right? Okay. Thank you for that input. Uh, um, based on that, uh, Sheikha, your views? Uh, my open views, this kind of worms. My views, my views, I think um, the reason why I feel, um, from my experience at least, it's a very sensitive matter, succession planning, you know, and especially when you come from a big uh, immediate family and you have a lot of siblings, a lot of people involved. Um, so it's a sensitive topic for us as a second generation to speak and be very vocal and transparent about it with a, because of respect, because and because and because because. But, and this is where I think more awareness is required uh, to the first generation. As I said, letting go is a bit, I think, not only only in my case, he is trying, he, I think my father now is more comfortable um, and, and uh, letting go, but because they come up, they come from a generation that has worked so hard to build what we have today, they can't just stay and without anything in hand to, 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 to work on. You know, they want to, they feel that they're fit enough to, and 
it, it you know it, it keeps them alive basically they can't yeah. uh, however they're a bit they're more selective on what to give and what hmm. to to keep are you do you get what i'm trying to Understand. say yeah. because they I'm come from a generation that has worked so hard to build an empire for themselves today <laughs> they 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 don't mind going on and on and on because this will keep their you know it will stimulate their brains it will keep yeah. you know uh, but and and our business is a very people oriented type of business hmm. we uh, basically built uh, Rotana based or uh, based on his network hmm. the network he gained from hmm. being a government official because before before uh, uh, dedicating his full time on 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 Rotana he was a government official for a for a long time and that's where he gained his network that's where he gained and it's for us to sustain it's for us to uh, to earn and uh, to grow so if they're not if this generation is not uh, aligned with the likes of the other generations and you know in their respective businesses yeah. then there won't be continuity right right but i had the opportunity and the privilege to to uh, to shadow him all this time and to get to know his values to get to know what he loves and the love he has for the company i had to i didn't have a choice but to love because of the love and the passion i see in him right so i think in my case it happened uh, I think uh, um, very um, uh, organically, mm. if that's the word. It's not kind of, it wasn't very um, uh, structured. Right. It was more organic. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Rodrigo, Dr. <clears throat> Ryan, your inputs <clears throat> on the views of the two ladies? Yes, uh, I, I think they, they give a, a perfect vision. Uh, how a succession could be and is unique in each family firm. But is it true that this is the, the, the problem of succession is a, if a, is a worldwide phenomenon. You know, it's, not, it's not related with the UAE or Middle East or Asia. What we can observe is certain kind of complexity in each cultural context. Just to give you, yeah. one is the hierarchical structure of the society, cultural element that could influence in this succession, the complexity of the family here in the Middle East, families are complex. Why? Because of the number of family members. When, when you ask a family, what is, what is your family? When you are a, you're a student, what is your family? Ah, my family is my father, my brother, my uncle, my dad. So it's the big family and the big picture, no? that maybe in another part of the world, the family is the nuclear family. This, this is a complexity. And the last element, maybe you touch it, is communication, how we communicate each other uh, in order. And I think it's a, it, here is an issue. We need, a, we need a more awareness. Uh, I think that's what the government is trying to do with the new law to impose in family business to go for a, for a corporate governance, the corporate governance could help to implement certain kind of tools to navigate the succession. Um, and, this, and the second element is who is prepared to, be, to retire? So be careful because when we are asking this to our parents, yes, hey, you have to retire because you are old or because you are... So be careful because no one is maybe prepared. So to be prepared to retire, we need two things. One is the psychological perspective. If you grow up with this firm, most probably you are not, because it's your baby, as you said, no? My father was a hard work in order to create them what we have. So it's an, it's an emotional attachment with this firm and what's happened inside. And the second is, maybe it's of course not, not, not your case, is to what extent we are economically ready to retire. No, in some families, we are not ready economically to retire because then period they said, oh, what will happen with my wealth? What happened if I live 20 years more? My children will be able to, to maintain the wealth. Hmm. So 
it's much more complicated when we are positioned the succession in one individual that is the, the head of the family, no? Uh, this is first. And the second is, and my second question is to the younger generation is this. And what do you observe? I don't know, Aisha and, and, and Sheikha, if you agree with this perspective. I see quite a lot of friction between family members to be the next CEO. It looks like that the only position to contribute to my family business is to be a leader of the company. And I think that's what we are trying to help with the, the student here that there are different positions in a family, family business context that you can contribute. The CEO position is only one. And maybe it's not for a family member in the second or third generation. No? That's some ideas that are coming to right. mind. Before I ask the ladies to respond to that, and uh, um, Dr. Ryan, your point of view? Yes, I think they're well covered, but I would like to add on one particular dimension regarding the gender, because I've done a bit of research on the gender aspect of succession and how that varies. I have published two case studies on succession from a female point of view and from a male point of view. There are challenges, uh, societal challenges and family challenges. So apart from, as rightly mentioned by Professor Basco, the cultural uh, dimensions are different across different regions with number of, you know, the complexities involved with uh, the family size and also how closed or open the family is. And second, I think gender is also a big challenge. And in today's time, uh, we have, you know, women educating themselves, women traveling the world and women taking care of businesses, which was not a norm a uh, couple of decades ago. So here we have seen a generational shift, not only from shifting the priorities to elders, from elders to children, but also the gender aspect. And this, I think, needs to be more systematic. And across, we need to have a proper plan. As uh, Ms. Shekha mentioned in the in introduction note, an example of her friend from Oman, how they have a structure. I think that structure would uh, help family businesses and in turn, uh, family offices for the future expansion and investments. Okay. Thank you for that input, um, Dr. Ryan. Uh, um, uh, ladies and gents, I just want to ask the um, the delegates, our uh, people watching, if you have a question and a comment, please uh, write it up in the chat function and then I can ask the panel members. Um, that's the only way that we can deal with it here in a more orderly fashion, so I would appreciate we go that. Uh, and something connected to this whole issue of succession planning um, is the issue of, of this third generation thing that was mentioned. Um, and, and I made the point that the research showed uh, 10 to 15% of family businesses in the UAE, only 10 to 15, make it to the third generation. And, and I do believe this is something that goes beyond um, the UAE. Why is this the case? Um, is, is it because of the inability to deal with disruption? Um, are there any specific skills that the youngsters don't have? And from what I hear from a shaker is that it's not necessarily the case. Uh, so why is longevity then a problem for family businesses as a whole? That's a very tricky question, honestly. Mm. And this is why I think you should, um, we can't take, uh, we, we can't be very ger generic when it comes to this. It all depends on the family and the aspirations and the vision of the family. As I said, uh, I was not selected to join based on, I think I was selected to join based on merit as well. So merit is very important. Things you've achieved over the years is very important. Uh, uh, it's more results driven. So if you look at things as results driven, I think you'll be able to assess and evaluate and be fair toward the family member. And there has to be acceptance as well. So I don't think, and in, 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 in not only in my case, but the gender is no longer an issue. Uh, now, uh, you know, uh, the older generation are aware of what we can do as women and we are doing it not, we're giving, we're being empowered, not just because 
were women and we want to show the world what uh, Middle Eastern women can do. We're doing it based on merit and mm. based on experience and based on ded dedication and based on all these things. Right. Now, uh, there is a law that says there has to be at least one female board in every, mm. we have the choice to refuse if we don't feel that we, we're, we're adding any value. So, mm. you know, they are giving us, they are, they are empowering us, but it mm. all depends on us as well. Right. You know, whether we want uh, and we feel that we can make a difference or not. Yeah. I don't know if I was able to answer your question, but I think every family is very different from one another. Every family has a vision that they want, they might want to continue yeah. or sustain or not. But yeah. I think still making them aware of uh, maybe what uh, other other uh, GCC countries are doing would be also good. Oops. Oops. Okay. Well, All right. Um, Ms. if I can ask you, from your perspective as a family office and your understanding of family business in general, why yeah. is there this, this saying, whether it's tongue in the cheek or not, neither here nor there, but that family businesses don't succeed beyond the third generation, uh, they don't go beyond that? Um, specific reasons or generic or general reasons for that? I mean, uh, Johan, it comes back to the thing that this is a very, um, it's a question that needs to be answered on a specific case by case. So it's on a basis by basis. We can't generalize the answer. We can't say this is the major reason why this is not happening. Or we can't say like, for example, this is the only reason why we're, it's not succeeding. But it also all comes back to the basis of, do we have the right governance, structure, clarity, buy-in, you know, Sheikha says merit. It's, it is really very important. I can't answer it just generically on an office perspective. It has to be on a case by case. And it has to be like specifically tailored because every single family office and every single family business is different. And that's what makes it unique, right? I mean, you would want to see the legacy continuing and every family office wants to see the legacy continuing, but there has to be controls and measures and structures and proper frameworks and people need to abide by the framework, right? You don't just put it and then say, okay, we'll change it or no one buys into it because then it just becomes, you know, setting a framework and never abiding by it and never doing it will never have a success for it. Okay. If if I want to be then uh, but deliberate, I can actually then say the absence of the points that you and Mosheikha actually mentioned. Um the absence thereof would be reasons for the lack of continuity. Uh, 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 Professor Basco, Dr. Ryan, from your perspective as academics, um, I've not been able to, to pin down the two ladies to give me factors, this is it, but I'm not sure that the two of you from an academic perspective, without mentioning very specific uh, organizations and without pinning it down to maybe the UAE, but from your research globally, what do you see as reasons? You know, they, I can recall something like the first generation makes the money, the second one uh, uh, spends it, and the third one destroys it. Um, you know, how much truth is in that, and what would be the reasons for it? Remember now, uh, His, His Highness uh, Sheikh uh, Mohammed bin Rashid spoke about this example of my father drove this, I'm driving this, my grandchild is going to drive a camel again. Why? No, no. I would let uh, Professor Pasco answer, then I'll answer. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will try to give some ideas and my point. Uh, first is, thank you, Sheikha and Aisha, when you are talking about merit in male and female, yes, because this is about merit and how we integrate in our 
family and business life is very important. And I like to hear this, uh, 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 this position. Regarding the, the survival of family business, uh, in general, in general, uh, while the company or the family is moving from one generation to another, the structure is more complex. So, and the question for any family business is how we are going to manage the complexity. At the very beginning was the father or the mother working together in order to make things happen, to give food, scholar, uh, university to our children. The second generation were seven children that all of them they would like and they have different needs, goals and expectations regarding the firm, the wealth and what they want. The third generation we are 50 cousins. So this complexity and this the number of people that you have to manage where emotion are there are very important. So the first, the first idea is I don't believe too much in this in this um, statistic or no, it's not a statistic, it is a, it is a set, it's true. But the good pro, the good idea is how we structure the governance of the family and the firm in order to survive longer, because the nepotism could damage companies in the second and third generation when there is not the father any longer or the mother any longer who can impose to a certain extent the voice what we need is mechanisms among peers what is our peer my brother and sister i can respect my father and mother but with my brother i can i can put my perspective and maybe i will i will have the imagine with your cousin when you are 25 30 or or more so it's very important to develop, in order to survive longer, a strong corporate governance in order to, to unify or align the goals and values that we have regarding the firm. OK. Thank you, uh, Professor. If, if I may, thank you. Thank you very much. Very well covered. Uh, if I just you know move out and take a look from a macro perspective, because here we are talking about, you know, micro, meso and macro perspectives together. Micro would be individuals or family members, uh, meso would be at the institutional level or organizational level. At, from the macro perspective, the world is changing faster than the families or family businesses. This is a reality. And the connectivity has resulted in different business models, which were not even applicable for the previous generation. I would like to substantiate yes. this with an example. My friend's family business back in Spain was strawberry farms. It was a second generation business. Grandfather and his brothers started, brothers, and no, no women there in the family farm. Then parents took over, women were involved. The third generation now, what they've done is they've converted the family, the strawberry farm into an experiential service provider where tourists from all over the world go there for strawberry picking, for strawberry jam making, and the whole day they spend in the farm paying a lot of euros. Now, this is where entrepreneurial spin-off from a traditional family business comes into picture. And that is what we, as back to Shekha's point, why are we talking, is the government telling, are we interested? Yes, as entrepreneurship educators, a family business is a major component and instilling entrepreneurial mindset among the young generation to treat family business not only as an opportunity to continue the legacy, as Ms. Sheikha has wonderfully been doing so, but also instilling the entrepreneurial spin-off opportunity, where if you are given a platform, convert that into a service provider from a product, from producing strawberries to giving service, experiential service for tourists from all over the world. That is an example which I think uh, we can adopt in this region, which I have. I've been mentoring two students uh, here in UA University uh, who would like to convert their honey farms into an experiential honey making process. Oh. The world does not know. It will be a wonderful one day, one day trip in Alain. Come and enjoy the process of making honey and also be part of how honey is made and what are the different byproducts of honey. Uh, that could be just, just an example to answer your question, Johan, if I'm done justice to your question. Well, that's the same thing that Nespresso and those guys have done where they're selling coffee beans to experiencing some other very nice cup of coffee at 5, 10, 20 times the price. Um, 
we, we, we've been alluding to challenges. You spoke about the world outside. Um, the world is changing at a macro level faster than family businesses can keep up. For that matter, that businesses can keep up. I'm not sure that we can really say it's only family businesses. The world is changing faster and faster, and we know that's become an old saying. It's not, it, it's, it's, it's not um, debatable. But when we look at these aspects and we look at succession planning, in addition to those and the challenges associated with those, what are the other challenges that family businesses face here in the UAE and in the GCC in general? Um, and if you can in bring in from the outside, uh, that much the better. Um, so your views on that, in addition to those that we've already discussed, as I said, a before, rapidly changing world, etc. Before, uh, before we allude to that, uh, um, Johannes, I think um, uh, interest is very important. Mm. Uh, it's very important that if you see um, that if you see an interest in, in in a family member, you have to take this as an opportunity to either develop or grow it. So if you're interested. Uh you will eventually be passionate. If you're passionate, then you will stay. But you have to be genuinely interested. And this is something that should be picked up by the first generation and should be developed, you know, and yeah. should be ultimately developed. Another thing is governance. I think governance is something that, it's a very important topic that still the first generation are not very well aware of its results. So maybe uh, presenting them with cases uh, that have produced positive results with the right governance should be helpful. But mm -hmm. also, again, going back to uh, business, business that they can relate to from the region. Okay. Your views on the additional challenges? Mm -hmm. Other challenges that you foresee? family businesses face. While you think I've just put you on the spot, sorry. Uh, 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 Prof. Basco, you wanted to, to to say something. No, 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 no. Just uh, continue with the, the, the debate, uh, Sheikha, uh, and then I will go to the another challenge that you, you mentioned. I think that's very good, is interest, is how to pick those uh, children or family members that are interested because they will develop and passion. And are genuinely will... interested. And this should be Generally, yeah. out of experience. As well, yeah, but you know what is sometimes the issue. Uh, I don't know if you experience or you observe uh, is what we are going to do with the next, with the with the other twenty, that they are not engaged. But how to educate them to be responsible owners? Why I said this because if you are an owner, if if I go to the to the stock market, I buy a share. What I I want, I want that the dividends annually and the price of the share they will increase so if you have 20 family members that they will expect the same they don't understand the logic of family firms and the family firms has different logic in terms of long-term perspective investment the, the 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 name of the family in the society so it's very important to not only to groom and to take care of those that are interesting but also to educate those that are not interesting yeah. because that could be a problem no I don't know if you observe uh, and this is could be an issue. This is an internal. This is an internal uh, challenge for me that the family uh, have. No, uh, focus also in those that are not interested. Focus those in law, for example, those that are external to the blood family but are coming to the family for a marriage or whatever. No, and and regarding the regarding the issue, I don't know uh, if you experience this. Is how new technologies are affecting the business models uh, of, of the firms, no? for example, cloud computing, artificial intelligence, big data, is how these families that are traditional have a particular business model, we are talking about, about now the business model, are going, to, are going to adapt their structure and their strategy in the new context, no? in order to be more, in order to be more profitable, to compete, and to adequate new technology. I don't know how you see this as a challenge, uh, Sheikha or Aisha, that you are more facing the, the, daily, the, daily, the daily life of family firm or family office, you know? Aisha, your view? Uh, 
Um, on the point of technology, I think it mm. is an enablement. Even if, for example, people are of, or family offices are very traditional, I think technology has really uplifted a lot of things, unraveled a lot of things, made decision-making actually much easier um, especially for um, decisions related, for example, to financial matters or whether these decisions are related to succession or whether these decisions might also unravel the way that they set the governance. And to the point about, you know, passion and interest, they do play a very important role because as Sheikha correctly said, once you have that passion and interest, you will make sure that it succeeded, Right. Um, there's always that um, internal driver for a lot of family offices um, in order to, you know, whether it's for growth, whether it's for succession, whether it's for, you know, expansion, mm -hmm. whether it's tapping into different regions, whether it's learning from um, experiences, there is always that element, right? So you're, we call them like, kind of like soft skills within that. It's not always, for example, you can set everything in place, right? You can set up proper governance. You can have a strict governance. You can have a lot of responsibility matrices set onto the people in the family office. But there's always that also soft part or the soft skills that also come into play. So these will always like define and drive for the future. Mm. Yeah. That's good. Mm -hmm. right. Can I ask a question? Just, just a simple question is, you know, here in Sharsha, uh, the university is working quite close to the Shira, the Sharsha Entrepreneurship Center. Uh, we are trying to develop a more dynamic family business and entrepreneurial ecosystem. And one, one question that generally we are asking, and we, the idea is to explore further from the, from the academic and also from the practical point of view, is the investment in, in, in new or startups, you know, how family firms are ready, willingness, and prepared to, to step into the, this world that is a startup. I don't know how you see this, uh, Aisha, from your perspective. Not going the investment, the traditional investment that are more secure, long-term perspective, uh, but regarding with the startups. I mean... Sorry, if you don't need to answer. If... <laughs> no, I'm just trying to link. So... Are you linking, mm. for example, startups approaching family offices? Or are you linking a family office being a st like a startup family office? No, 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 no. It's family office investing mm. Mm. in a startup. So it's understanding the logic. What does it mean to invest in a startup? No. Uh, no. I mean, look, the, um, the reason why family... Yeah. Look, that comes down, right? If they have a framework, they've got an investment committee, maybe they've got a head of investment at the family office, um, might have priorities. Is this part of their strategy? Do they invest into this, right? So remember when we discussed about having proper frameworks and having proper yeah. you know, set of um, like um, defined ways of working, what are they interested in? Is this something they want to do? Is it not having that governance in play? Like, for example, do they have an investment committee that looks at things that come across to them and then say, yes, we're going to take this opportunity or they say, no, we're not. And then um, neglecting the interference because sometimes that opportunity might come from one of the family members, right? As part of the family office. And I think um, more about like how would they invest or their strategy and in investment and whether they want to do with startups or with um, investments that exist or not, or companies that are, are looking for, you know, series A or B or whatever part of the, um, you know, um, financial impact into it. I mean, that is something up to the family office, right? We can only um, help and support and educate and guide and provide yeah the tools and educational resources and bring on board experts or we can link them to professional advisors who would support them onto that. But moreover and beyond, I think it comes down to the family office itself. How do they want to position themselves? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there are some restrictions as well on us as an association, but at the end of the day, it does come down like if they've really defined their framework, their governance, their structure, 
I mean, how do they want to look like and how do they want to be perceived? I think that's the only way where they'll find a solution to that one. That's good. Thank you. Ryan, Dr. Ryan, you have a point to make. The discussion. the discussion started with technology, but Professor uh, Vasco took it to, you know, the investments in startups, which I want to link both. Uh, how open are we today as family businesses for entrepreneurship? And has that resulted in, you know, success or failure of family succession or sustainability? For example, if a, if a family business invests in a startup of a family member and a non-family member, how, how are these challenges seen? How are these dynamics worked upon? Uh, that is that just to continue the discussion in the right way uh, to integrating technology and entrepreneurship in family businesses, not particularly family offices, which Aisha was very clear, family business per se. How has this uh, changed the whole uh, discussion and dynamics in practice? The family business side? Uh, Ms. Professor Ajay, Basket, we just uh, share your uh, research insights and with Shekha with your experience. I think you're on mute. Yeah, can you repeat the question again? Okay, uh, the question was technology and entrepreneurship. These are the two, you know, uh, pillars, I may say, of business, not only family business as such. How do family business see this? Uh, investing in technology startups, which necessarily is not the core of the family business, and if the startup is from a family member or a non-family member who, who is already part of the family business, how, I, how do again, this? I, this? This is a very, um, um, the subject is, is um, we need to, we need to discuss this with a person that that's an, is an expert in this field. And this is something we have. We have recently actually promoted someone within Rotana uh, to be the chief information officer. And he will be uh, very focused on this. Uh, and it, it all depends, again, on the results we would see ultimately from this as a business. So if it will positively impact the business, whether in, in a, in a cost-efficient manner or whether in a more... Um, it depends on what, what we're, we're, we're looking to see as a, as a result of investing in this technology. Understanding our guests, uh savings savings to our owners savings to our to the operations uh, there's a lot of elements that we would look at when we invest or when we support or engage either startups or or, or uh, 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 technology uh, based companies and that's interesting yeah. But because it's a very uh, it's a, a subject that requires a, a specific type of expertise, we have the right experts within the field and within the company that can evaluate and assess how beneficial this technology would be to the company. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. I, I would like us to move on to a point that uh, Prof. Basker, you addressed early on, and that was referring to a new law promulgated by the government. Uh, and the question is, what is the regulatory environment like in the UAE? Uh, and how does it impact family businesses? Uh, to what extent does it support the family businesses? Um, and can we also sort of then glance at worldwide? To what extent are governments globally supporting family businesses? Why do we find such a, a focus on family businesses and a very high profile of family businesses in the UAE? What role does government play in this? Or are they kind of innocent bystanders and here and there say, right, here's something to help you or there's something to take out this a limitation or whatever. Um, what support does the UAE um, family business sector then get from, from the government and what role does it play? I say you have the EFOA. Um, that's part and parcel, I think, of 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 your realm, your environment, your sector, your ecosystem. Um, sorry, Johannes, I just had an issue with the with the with your voice. So if you just repeat what you've just sorry. said, yeah. apologies. No, not a problem. I said that um, Prof. Basco referred to. Uh, laws by the government and I was wondering to what extent 
the regulatory environment in the UAE, GCC, globally for that matter, what role does government play in enhancing the success of family businesses? I've addressed in the beginning the massive role and impact family business has, the sector has, the ecosystem has on the UAE, 70% of the GDP. It is huge. Um, what kind of role does government play in, in, in pushing the success of family business? Sure, of course, the government plays a very important role, right? You can see nowadays that a lot of the governments, and especially in the UAE, have either established regulatory bodies or have established specific offices to look after successions of family offices, right? So it is a it is something that is on their radar because, at least speaking of it from the UAE perspective, the UAE government looks at family offices and family businesses as their support arm for the government, right? They look at them as like this, their peers and their pillars to grow. I mean, family offices are kind of the ambassadors of any country they're into, right? They succeed into it, they contribute to it, they give to it, they can go globally from where they are. So I really think that they do play a role of course, regulations also play a role, but they could always be tricky, right? A regulation can be in favor of something, but could be um, sometimes not in favor of something that might result in some of the family offices actually not really benefiting from that regulatory perspective or that regulatory framework, right? So even when regulations are in place and things are put, it always takes time because they look at it from every different angle and aspect. So I I really think that, yes, governments do take care of family offices, they do take care of businesses, and they ensure and they would love to always see them succeed because they see them as, I mean, as part of their success, right? Okay. As a country. Yeah, I think that, I think the, the vision that you are placing here is correct and is what is happening now. Uh, for a capital, for a family business, for investor or for entrepreneurship, what they are looking for is a stability. A stability and protection. And I think that is what this country is giving to a capital, for example, family office, what happened now in the IFC. Yes, a family office actually from, from different parts of the world, they are coming to, to UAE to set up their family, family office there. That's because of security, because of the law, and there is certain kind of regulation that benefit them in order to live. And then there are other kind of law. There is a, the new family business law, as we talk with certain kind of characteristic for family business, you can set up your, you can, you can have certain kind of conditions or family business that can benefit you. But also there is a, there is certain uh, programs like Thabat is for next generation of family members, is how to develop a culture of entrepreneurship in new generation of family members to create an, an spin-off, to create new projects related with the family, and to give the opportunity to next generation of family members within the family to develop new ideas. I think the government is doing things, and this is a correct position, uh, in order to make sure that there is a solid position of family business to transfer this wealth that you mentioned at the very beginning from one generation to another and to keep being the, the economic pillar of this of the UAE, you know, and UAE, Saudi, and we are talking about the Gulf also area, how important they are family business. You know? Okay. Uh, Dr. Ryan, any point of view? Are you comfortable? Can we move on? You are, okay. Um, I think we, we have many questions uh, still, Jan. We'll move on. Sorry? I think we still have a few more questions that we'll move on. Uh, indeed, there's quite a number. We're not going to get to all of them, but I'm at peace with that because I think the dynamic is wonderful. Um, we, we alluded to some of this, and, and, and Mashecha spoke about um, merit and the youngsters wanting to uh, be to participate and those that have a genuine interest. So when we look at the whole issue of the management models involved within family businesses, um, we've seen family owned, family managed, and then I've heard also referred to and seen examples uh, where uh, people actually saying this is what we're about. 
Um, we're family owned, but professionally managed, which per definition does not necessarily exclude family members because they are and can be professional uh, managers. What what are the typical kind of management models that we do see in the family business ecosystem in the UAE? Um, and uh, what do they entail? Are there unique characteristics and unique features that we're finding here? Yeah? May I start, Johan? May I start? Just share my... Please. Okay. So uh, one unique feature is the closely knit family, uh, which is a bit more unique to the region rather than just one country per se. Uh, having worked in Oman and in UAE and with family businesses as part of my entrepreneurship ecosystem development, I think family business importance, back to the chef as why are we discussing? I think it's a spillover of entrepreneurship, uh, you know, uh, investments, efforts and time by the government and by the universities. And that has resulted. I think everybody now uh, is awake uh, when you're talking about entrepreneurship ecosystem. Uh, we have a huge family business ecosystem, which is underutilized, uh, under directed or advised, especially for the next generation. And I think the interest of uh, the, this generation has to be synced with the opportunity of the family business legacy and platform it provides. So before going to the management models, uh, we have an individual model of a sweet spot, which is quite popular among uh, you know, the management books and uh, uh, teaching case studies. We have the competency, we have the passion, and we also have the money part. I think this has been understood by individuals, but this varies from family to family, as rightly mentioned by Ms. Shekha, and it varies from culture to culture. What is one person's or individual sweet spot need not be the family sweet spot. The family business might be having other interests, which demands some other competency, which the next generation is not keen on taking up. Mm -hmm. So this is where uh, universities, educators, and scholars come into picture, trying to you know uh, guide students and preparing the next generation in aligning their interest with the opportunity and the base family business provides. This, I think, should you know sum it up as a discussion to uh, way forward and success in and sustainability of family business. Okay. Any of the other panel members have a point of view on that? Let me move on. When we look at family businesses, they represent a very specific identity. Um, are they more sensitive to issues such as geopolitical turbulence and the issue, the factors surrounding that? Are they more sensitive to issues to uh, link to the UN so, um, Sustainability Development Goals, um, ESG issues, or is it business as usual? Are family businesses more sensitive to these factors or not? And it, uh, uh, maybe potential reasons why. I mean, Johan, I'll take that one up. I mean, it varies from family to family, right? So maybe the next generation of family leaders might show a bit of more tendency into considering ESG matrix, for example, investing into more sustainable businesses or uh, for example, focusing their efforts onto these topics like, I mean, carbon footprint, all of these pressing topics that are coming out for the environment, for the world. But I think it varies from family to family. There's no specific thing that we can touch upon to. Okay. My two professors? Yes, I think... Research? Yes, yeah. please, please. No, no, I, I think it's important to, to, to contextualize this kind of question. I could be very general, I think. As any, fa as any business, for family businesses, business as, as usual, is we have to make money because without making money, we cannot survive. So that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's what I am talking and general we are discussing. So once we have a sustainable model, we have to we have a, a, a things in place. We can start thinking about different kind of goals that we can achieve as being part of the society. And there and there there is a very important point. 
family business are embedded in the society. So they have a, an explicit interest in the society where they operate. Why? Because my name is here. I have my red of friends, contacts. Yes. So I have three generations in the same place. So I am part of this environment geographically, culturally, environmental. So most probably I will pay attention to certain kind of things that could contribute to the well-being of my society. But first I have to make money. Okay, so uh, it's about continue, money. Johan. Have of money. Dr. Ryan, please. Uh, so as rightly mentioned, family business is business as usual. It is no different. It has to make money, it has to survive. But one thing which differs from the definition is families involved here. Now I go, I go back, always I go back when you're talking about family business, we go back to the family dynamics. 30 years before, did children be part of the discussion on politics? No. We were not part of the discussion on politics or geopolitics, but today kids have smartphones. They are part of movements. They are part of the change campaigns, signing campaigns. Also, it is the technology which has embedded the exposure into the kids and the younger generation, and they are more uh, you know, open to voice their opinion. And as Ms. Aisha mentioned, maybe take decisions based on what they think is right, irrespective of whether the elders in the family agree or disagree with them. I spent some time in UK before the COVID struck during my doctoral degree, and that was the Brexit time. And when we had discussions, we had some of the family members himself, themselves disagree. When the younger generation wants to be more open, wants to collaborate, when the older generation sees it as a problem, we saw that as numbers, which were you know all over the media, where you have the own family members disagreeing on geopolitical issues, on country issues, or even sustainability issues. Uh, we have you know different uh, decisions taken by family members yeah. across genders based on sustainability. So this should tell you and inform us that the family dynamics has a role to play in family business. However, businesses as usual uh, from the modest part. Brings us to the point of culture. Uh, what is the role of then of culture, of business culture, of family culture? Um, shouldn't we find in business and family businesses a much stronger alignment between the values of doing good, uh, doing good by doing good, um, the aspirational purpose? Uh, Mashecha referred to, you know, the vision of the organization. Aisha referred to the the role of 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 vision. So uh, surely these should be more visible or pronounced in family businesses. Or is that wishful thinking? Because you did, did make the point, both of you, the two professors, business as usual, family business is business as usual. And the underlying principle is you need to make a profit in order to continue the sustainability of the organization. And that is undeniably so. Now, it's no use we do good because if we'd only do good, and that's the only reason uh, we will go bankrupt. We might feel good about ourselves do in the process of doing so, but we definitely will go bankrupt. Um, the role of culture then becomes, you can just confirm, as we don't need to de debate it for a long period of time. It does drive this whole issue. And we need then an alignment, and we do need to see an alignment between family business, the culture of the family, and the culture of the organization. Or not. May I share an example and just Please. answer the question, Johan? There's a family business back in India. My friend is part of it, third generation into the family business. And he's collaborating with a family business in Italy, which is a second generation. The collaboration culture, I think, uh, really has been a hit among the next generation. They have realized the world is the marketplace now, not India for India and Italy for Italy or Europe. So two manufacturing family businesses collaborating so that they can use the best of the both the worlds, the market size of India and the technology of the Europe. And that is where I think the collaboration, their parents never bothered to collaborate across the seas. The maximum collaboration was within, within the you know, city, for example. But this cross country, cross region collaboration culture, I think is quite predominant across regions, irrespective of their individual differences in culture, traditions uh, as a family. Okay. 
comments by the rest? about the talking about the, the culture also it's true what you are mentioned this cross-cultural because most probably there is a there is a, a common sense of value between two family business across the world uh, even coming from different contexts no in this case mm -hmm. India or, or Italy but there are some common values in this family business and what is this common values are this idea to continue the business the the, the time we are investing in creating wealth, uh, the generational coming and forward. So there are certain common values that make me to speak the same languages between two businessmen. And it's very important. No? Finally, the founders, yes, and the family of the founder imprint certain kind of values, goal, attitudes, behavior in those people that are working inside that that the idea is to transfer from one generation to another, no? the way that they are doing business. Yeah, sure. Okay. Last question. <laughs> We've spoken a lot about what's happening. We looked at the challenges. We looked at what drives them. If we look at the immediate short term and the longer term of and for family businesses, what should be the key priorities? Um, we could have a practical view from Ms. Sheikha and Ms. Aisha, and then we can contrast it then with the research view of Prof. Basco and Dr. Ryan. Um, see how we feel about what should family businesses be cognizant of looking into the future? What should they be focusing on? What are the priorities you should be addressing? as family businesses. Over to you, ladies, you first. I think being clear about the vision you have in mind and where you want it to go is very important. How this is communicated to the second generation is also very, very important. So communication is key for you to achieve uh, what you want or what you have in mind in terms of goals and vision. It has to be communicated in a very clear manner. Um, uh, again, going back, identifying the right talent within the second generation, identifying um, people that have uh, or members that have uh, uh, um, um, uh, that are like minded, not very like minded, but have a lot of values aligned is also very important for continuity. And um, Education as well is very important. Good. In terms of business per se, are there any business imperatives, areas that you need to look at, areas that you need to stay out of? Or is that going to be quite, you know, a factor driven by the ecosystem? I think it needs to be assessed as and when it comes. Okay. So having okay. a fair assessment also by a third party who is unbiased is also important. Sometimes you get a bit emotional with when it comes to things. You have to always have um, a, a rational sounding board, you know, that could actually give you uh, an opinion without being biased. Okay. Thank you for that, Ms. Sheikha. Um, Ms. Aisha, over to you. I mean, Sheikha touched on one point that I noted down, which was educating the next generation. So it is very important that we educate and we ensure that the essential skills and whatever experience from outside the family office can contribute to them is very important because once you have great interest and a business that has great talent and a family office that is surrounded like by super well-educated, talented people, it will have a deeper understanding. The family culture, of course, will play a role, but there will be a deep understanding and acceptance of the family's values and intentions. My second point will also be embracing diversity. So this is something that is very important because diversity is an important element to any business, whether it's a family office, it's a family business. It has been proven that businesses really increasingly need diversity to be thought into them for them to be successful. 
So having someone within the family office or a large family office, like similar like a corporation, are more successful when they are attracting and retaining a diverse pool of people from within and from outside of the family office. And I think it brings a very unique family culture into the offices. And I think Shekha would um, maybe support this because she's actually experiencing it, right? She's bringing in very experienced, well-talented people in order to be part of the office, in order to embrace it, to bring new thoughts into it, and to drive it to being to the aspiration that herself and her father have into it, and in order to continue it. Because I think Sheikha likes, for example, I will not speak on your but Sheikha, you would love to see, for example, people maybe challenging or bringing to you new ideas to the table, or maybe asking you things outside of the comfort zone, right? You would want to have that internal challenge because it only brings out the better out of it, right? It will help it to succeed. It will help it achieve its goals and objectives. Yes. Right. Super. Thank you. It is very insightful. Um, Prof. Basco, Dr. Ryan. Yes. If if I have to give uh, ideas about the future and, and to try to put things in perspective, is I think there are two priorities in, in any family business in general. One is to develop a sustainable business model that can be flexible enough across generations. And the second is to maintain a cohesive and unit family. Yes, there are, I think, the two important elements to survive longer. How to, how to achieve? Yes, I don't know. Uh, how to achieve is each family member, each family firm should, be, should develop their own tool and roadmap in order to achieve these two elements. Education, corporate governance, family office, how we are shaping the daily life of the decision making in a family is very important to achieve these two things. Good. You were actually quite, um, you know, given the fact that you're part of the fourth generation family uh, business, mm -hmm. I should have prioritized you and, and victimized you for more input. Why were you successful and in going into the fourth generation? Um, but I will not do that to you at, at uh, In another talk, we can talk about my family. There are good <laughs> and bad things, like in any family, happy and some sadness, yeah. Great. Look forward to that. Dr. Ryan, you have the last word. Uh, I think uh, the, the way we started the discussion, even before the webinar started, uh, it is important for us to you know, talk about it, teach about it, and research about it. All the three should go hand in hand. And uh, Professor Basco has published a book, I think, first of its kind for the region, which I, I, I uh, very proudly share with uh, my students. In fact, we are using it in the new program we're developing. I have developed a course on family business management, which uh, Johan knows about it. We need to talk more about it and teach the fundamentals. While it is business as usual, there is family dynamics coming into play, which is a bit more complicated than a regular business where you'll join as an employee or start up on your own fresh. We are coming with a baggage, baggage of happiness and disappointments, as rightly mentioned by Professor Vasco, baggage of opportunities and challenges, and more importantly, a platform for you to excel if you have the right entrepreneurial mindset and to deal with the family dynamics. This has to be taught. Can we, can we create entrepreneurs? Can we teach entrepreneurs? This was the you know, age old discussion. Can we, can we create family business on this? No, but we can definitely guide them and facilitate the learning process. How to do? It is their decision. But what? I think universities with government together should uh, set a platform for students, at least provide the opportunity for them to learn more and then let students take the decision of whether they want to continue or start on their own. Right. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that's all that we have time for. I've written down, if I can just summarize briefly then, looking into the future. We've looked at the past, we looked at the present, we've seen that family businesses have a unique role to play, they make a huge contribution, and that uh, uh, things such as succession planning is very important, um, that continuation, com communication, education, all of them, being of the utmost priorities in order to ensure future success. Um, the issue of uh, uh, communication, I spoke about that, not to be too emotional, rational outlook, um, 
embracing diversity, embracing sustainability, uh, specifically of business models being flexible um, and, and changing to the, 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 the business ecosystem at large, being flexible, um, being cohesive as a family. Thank you so much. From so much. on behalf of the UAU, the College of Business and Economics, for the five of you, I like for the four of you, for your time, your willingness to share your insights, um, your experience, your wisdom. I, for one, uh, was the ultimate beneficiary uh, of listening to you and being able to ask questions. Thank you for educating me and thank you for educating our, our audience. Rest assured, it is much appreciated. And so we much. really appreciate it from the bottom of our heart. Thank you so thank you. much. Thank you. Thank and you to our much. audience, thank have you for... Lovely, have a lovely day and thank you for having me. It was thank our you. privilege, Mashecha. Thank, thank you for being here. Thank you audience, very much, everyone. Thank you for the audience as well for uh, listening and for being here. Uh, your support of our uh, STEPS webinar series is much appreciated. All thank the you. best. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.